Well, hello, YouTubers. Uh, I thought for this program I would uh, consider a question from uh, one of you viewers, one of Jehovah's Witnesses writes that uh, he was just reading in the Watchtower and they said that no other world power will arise after the Anglo-American dual world power, which makes up the feet of the metallic image described in Daniel. That means that China or anyone else cannot arise and become dominant because the Anglo-American duo is the last world power. However, the U.S. dollar is collapsing and the nations are gearing up for World War III. This should tell us where we are in the stream of time. The Anglo-American system is at its end. Could you please do a video on where we are in the stream of time and how close we are to the authentic presence of Jesus? Well, I'm glad that um, some of you appreciate uh, the message I've been trying to get across for uh, you know 20 years is that the presence has not begun, that Christ has not returned. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a paradox, and it, it can be maddening uh, to try to speak to Jehovah's Witnesses about these matters, because on the one hand, uh, we appreciate that the Watchtower has uh, done an amazing work as far as fulfilling Jesus' promise to have the good news preached in all the inhabited earth, and they've given us a basis for putting faith in the Bible and God's promise for setting up his kingdom. And we believe in the coming of the new world. So on the one hand, the Watchtower has brought these fresh and vital truths to us that have been totally obscured by the churches of Christendom. And on the other hand, it teaches uh, this fable, this myth, this artfully contrived false story that the kingdom was established in 1914 and that Satan was hurled down in that year and that the last days began, the final part of the days and, and all of that. And of course, to try to speak with Jehovah's Witnesses about that is considered blasphemous. Uh, how could the faithful slave be wrong? How dare you? We couldn't, we won't even consider the mere suggestion that anything this slave teaches is wrong. And if it is wrong, it's not your place to say they're wrong. And th that's the dominant attitude. And it's easy to see why some people refer to the Watchtower as a cult because of this cult-like mentality that you cannot question anything that you are taught. And if you do, then there are repercussions. And that's just the way it is. But uh, there is something uh, very wrong with the Watchtower's whole uh, prophetic, uh, what they call it, exegesis. So let's consider this viewer's question uh, a little closer. The Watchtower did make this statement that trying to place us in the stream of time, we're now deep, 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 deep into the end that began in 1914. And based upon the fact that the Watchtower now identifies the iron and clay feet of this metallic image, as the Anglo-American dual world power, which I might interject is a fairly new adjustment because when the uh, Pay Attention to Daniel book came out 21 years ago, they were saying that the feet uh, made up a, a composite of a politically divided world and they didn't identify the iron or clay with any particular government. And of course, I have way before <laughs> the Watchtower's adjustment. 
So they finally came around to something that I've been talking about. But before that adjustment came, then if you were to speak about it, then you were running ahead or you were, uh, you know, whatever. So anyway, now they've come to this proper conclusion, I believe, that the iron and clay represent the Anglo-American dual world power. The iron is indicative of the empire. And when we say the Anglo-American dual world power, I don't, I don't think the Watchtower really appreciates this. They uh, likely are referring to Great Britain, and Great Britain and the United States have had this so-called special relationship since the end of World War II. Uh, but that's not really what the iron represents. Great Britain is merely uh, a nation state that is part of what is called the British Empire. What well, I should qualify that. They don't call it the British Empire. <laughs> they used to. Uh, but now they want us to believe that there's no such thing as the British Empire. But we do have to appreciate there's Great Britain, the nation state with its prime minister and parliament. And then there is the monarchy and the city of London that just so happened to reside in Great Britain. But they rule over Great Britain and a large part of the world through the monetary and financial system that runs through uh, the city of London. I won't go into that now, but that's the iron. That's the empire. It tolerates democracy. It can't totally crush it, which it would like to. You know, when we talk about nation states and, and we, you know, we can read in the Bible about nations like, you know, Egypt, uh, Edom, Moab, and Israel, those were nations. But what really qualified them as nations that was that they, it was the ethnic grouping, people of the same nationality. And of course, they established uh, borders for their territory. And Jehovah really set that system up. Um, anyway, when the Roman Empire became dominant, it obliterated borders and nations. And for the longest time, over a thousand years, uh, the Roman Empire ruled Europe through, of course, the Roman Catholic Church. And there were no nations, just tiny little fiefdoms. There was a great YouTube video that, uh, well, I'm sure it's still online, but... Um, it shows the, the uh, political divisions of Europe over the last 500 years in a time-lapse map that changes as, and it's quite interesting uh, because as I say, we think of the nation states as uh, something that's been around for a long, long time. But the modern nation state system really did not come into existence until about 1500s. The, the so-called Treaty of Westphalia ended the Hundred Years' War and all the, these religious wars that have been destroying Europe and established national sovereignty as this supreme. And that is really the beginning of the modern nation-state system, which is uh, opposed to the empire. And so the empire has been trying to get rid of this uh, nation-state system. That's why we see uh, so-called refugees flooding into Europe and into the United States. They want a borderless world with nations not being sovereign, as the tweet, <laughs> Tweety, as the Treaty of Westphalia uh, made certain. I remember Tony Blair. So he was the Prime Minister, of course, of England, of Britain. Uh, and after he left office, he, you know, he's been part of the, this uh, global initiative, this um, empire. And he said a few years ago that the nation state system is over. Westphalia is over. 
meaning that they are so confident that they are going to destroy this nation-state system and allow this empire to rule the world, uh, that he, he made that statement. And uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, I mean, when I, I talk about the Watchtower, it, you know, their entire prophetic um, foundation is skewed to 1914. But it's really our business to examine these things and to make sure, right? And when we do that, when we closely examine these prophecies and put them together, it's not just one prophecy, because prophecy in its totality presents a big picture. And all the little prophecies are like pieces in a puzzle. And when you put all the pieces together, then uh, you see the big picture, as they say. And that's what we need to do with Bible prophecy. So this prophecy in Daniel with the feet of iron and clay, that's one piece of the puzzle. Now, the Watchtower's comment that the Anglo-American dual world power is the last world power, uh, that comment is partly true and also contradictory to what, something else that the Watchtower recognizes, that there is an eighth king that springs from the seventh. So the Anglo-American dual world power, we recognize, is the seventh world power. It's the head of the wild beast that received the mortal stroke in Revelation, the 13th chapter, and then revives. What about the eighth king? Surely it's a world power. It springs from the seven. And it, it does exercise power. Because if you read in the 17th chapter of Revelation, this eighth king wields such extraordinary power that it destroys Babylon the Great. And all the kings stand afar off and tremble. They're afraid to intervene in behalf of religion. So we're talking about a very powerful government that is able to do that. Has the eighth king begun ruling yet? Well, the watchtower says yes, and that's why they make no mention of it in this watchtower that the questioner is referring to. Uh, so they have uh, relegated the eighth king to this very small role. The eighth king came into existence with the League of Nations. And, of course, the League... <laughs> It, the League was a joke. And as I've mentioned many times, the United States wasn't even a member of the League. So how could this eighth king rule over all the nations? It didn't rule over the United States. It had no authority. And there were quite a few nations that were not part of the League of Nations. In fact, the Soviet Union was originally, and then it was thrown out. And the Soviet Union comprised a, a very large part of the world. And then supposedly the, the beasts climbed out of the abyss during World War II, and now the United Nations is this eighth king. But it is a pretty powerless institution as well. Although I suspect that it will become the eighth king in the future. And that could be done by bringing down the present system and fulfilling this empire's dream of transferring sovereignty from the nation states to an institution that could serve as a global government, a world empire. And I refer to the United Nations as sort of a placeholder because it takes a, a, quite a bit of uh, institutions to govern the world. You can't just do it out of, the, out of your garage, you know. So, and it can't be something that's just set up overnight. So the United Nations is uh, an institution that has the 
you know, the bureaucratic infrastructure, it could function as a world government under the right conditions. Uh, the viewer there said the dollar is crashing. Well, that's that's not really accurate. The dollar is actually strengthening against other currencies, but uh, I'd say there's a, there's a currency war going on uh, along with quite a few other types of wars, right? I mean, cyber wars and proxy wars. Just last week, supposedly Iran fired a bunch of missiles into Saudi Arabia. It looked like, oh boy, we've got our uh, our war now, and uh, President Trump didn't take the bait. <laughs> Somebody wants a war. Uh, but yeah, the, so it's not really accurate to say the dollar is collapsing. But uh, given the tremendous amount of debt overhanging, it could collapse. And I'm certain it will collapse. And it won't be a gradual trailing off. And that's the thing. I mean, we, when we look at this uh, prophecy in the 13th chapter of Revelation, the seventh head of this beast receives a mortal wound and then revives. Um, I suspect it will be something sudden overnight. That's the way things happen, you know. 9-11, 2001, you woke up one morning and World Trade Centers are on fire and collapsing. And the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Uh, was uh, hit by a kamikaze, you might say. So when things happen, they happen suddenly. And I can't tell you uh, the details. Uh, for example, someone asked me, do you think Brexit will... I don't know. I don't know if it'll come about. I don't know if it'll be a trigger to bring the system down. Uh, a false flag, like what happened, let's like, say, with uh, this rockets hitting this big Saudi oil refinery. Uh, any number of things could happen. They, they could set off a nuke somewhere. I mean, that would put the fear into people and bring down the, the money system would just disappear. And well, that's that is the intention of these imperialists who want to do away with Westphalia. As I'd mentioned in a previous video, Mark Carney, a former governor of the Bank of England, he said, let's do away with the dollar as a reserve currency, set up some crypto thing. So again, they're, they're telegraphing their intentions. And so... The Watchtower says that the head of the wild beast received this uh, mortal wound back in 1914. They have to say that because they know how these prophecies fit together. For example, in the 12th chapter of Revelation, Satan, the devil, is thrown out of heaven, the dragon, the original serpent, He's thrown out of heaven and down to the earth. Woe for the earth and for the sea, because the devil has come down to you knowing as a short period of time. And he goes off to wage war with those who, who obey Christ, who have the work of witnessing about Christ. So the remnant, the remnant of the woman, of the seed of the woman. So he goes off and wages war with her for time, time and half at times. And she's given a place in the wilderness for 1,230 days and so forth. Well, in Revelation, this uh, beast, when it has its uh, mortal head wound, that begins, when it comes back to life, it goes to war against the holy ones for 42 months. That's the same as the time, time, and half a time. It's also mentioned in Daniel. So the Watchtower knows that when Satan is thrown out, th this beast dies. The system dies, collapses. Can you imagine if the government of the United States and Great Britain ceased to function? 
it would be a horrifying ordeal for the masses. And that's what's going to happen. I know the future because I understand these Bible prophecies. I know this did not occur in 1914. Can anyone provide evidence that the United States and Britain collapsed during World War I? Come on. They were victorious. Britain lost a lot of men. It was horrific. Uh, the trench warfare was just a bloody nightmare and a senseless slaughter. But not so for the United States. They stayed out of the war until 1917. And when they finally sent the Doughboys in, they tipped the tide fairly quickly in a year, and it was over. So, you know, there were about 10 times more Americans killed in the American Civil War. Of course, they were fighting each other, but uh, still, half half a million, I believe, compared to what, maybe uh, 50,000, I believe. It, of course, World War II was uh, much worse. The United States was in it from the beginning, at least when Pearl Harbor was attacked. But it, it is simply uh, absurd to suppose that this prophecy of the head of Satan's system receiving this mortal wound and then coming back to life. And furthermore, we know that it could not have happened because when the beast comes back to life, those who admire it wonderingly have their names taken out of the book of life. That's serious stuff. That means no resurrection, permanent death, lake of fire, you're dead and forgotten from Jehovah's standpoint. That's, that's some bad news. Why would Jehovah issue such a harsh judgment? Because when this beast dies and comes back to life, Christ's kingdom will be ruling. Well, the Watchtower says, yeah, the kingdom's been ruling since 1914, and this beast came back to life, and anybody who... Uh, supports this beast, receives the 666. <laughs> now, you talk with one of Jehovah's Witnesses. If you want to do some cart work, go up to one of Jehovah's Witnesses in their cart and say, ask them what they think about the 666. And they, they don't put much importance to it. They think that anyone who, who supports Satan's system, yeah, you get the 666. But they don't think it through. Because here Jehovah's Witnesses are out in their ministry trying to convert people, trying to reach people and teach people, and yet they at the same time imagine that these people have already been marked with the 666. It, 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 <laughs> they don't understand. If a person has this symbolic 666, there's no redemption. There's no salvation. You can't Get your name put back in the book of life. It's been blotted out permanently. That's the whole point. That's the point of the 666. It's judgment from God during the hour of judgment. If a person does not accept God's kingdom but prefers to, root, to live under the rule of Satan, then they have to suffer the same fate as Satan the devil which is permanent death. Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. That represents complete destruction. His followers go with him into the lake of fire. If that judgment has been issued since 1914, Jehovah's Witnesses have been wasting a lot of time preaching. But of course, they haven't been wasting their time. A lot of people that were formerly very political, part of this system, have repented, converted, dedicated themselves. They couldn't do that if they had been marked with the 666. So all of that is in the future. That's why I say I know the future. This system is going to collapse overnight. 
probably during a war. There's going to be a war, a Third World War, as the viewer said. I think I've reached a few people with that. But you don't have to be a genius to see that. Almost every day there's a, a new provocation or a, a new war exercise. China and Russia and India now held the biggest military exercise ever a few days ago, fine-tuning, gearing up, preparing for what is coming. And uh, the prophecies tell us what is coming. So uh, where are we in the stream of time? Well, it, no one knows the day or the hour. That's why Christ exhorted us to keep awake, keep on the watch. I'm coming at an hour you do not think likely. That could be any hour because Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, yeah, Christ came in 1914. The judgment, house of God, all right, that's all done deal. You know, all this is all, all happened already. And so Christ will come at a time they do not think likely because they think he's already come. Of course, the watch ever says he's coming again. There's two or three second comings, but that's uh, nonsense. So anyway... Um, I think I think we're we're right there. Probably, you know, I'd be guessing, but I can't see this thing going on for years and years, a couple more years. I think they're very desperate now because this wave of populism that began with the election of Donald Trump it's starting to take root in other nations in Europe. Uh, just the very fact that the Brits want out of this European empire. And again, going back to the nation-state system, the EU is uh, a very effective means of nullifying national sovereignty. There's an appearance of sovereignty. Nations have, you know, their little parliaments and all that, but let them try to, well, block this flood of refugees coming into their country. Brussels said, no, -uh -uh, you can't do that. You've got no borders. You got to let these people in, no matter if they, you know, they're against your values. They have a different religion. They're going to rape you, you know. You, so, uh, the empire is has a foothold already. The EU is also is like a placeholder for empire. All those twenty seven nations of Europe, they've already forfeited a good bit of their sovereignty. But now there's this uprising of populism. Is uh, so there's this back and forth pushing we'll see uh, but I, I, I think one morning you're going to wake up and it's like oh baby look what happened and uh, people are going to be freaking out and uh, that's what the hour of judgment is all about Jehovah wants to find out where is your faith huh thanks for watching <laughs>